We're going to look at John 15. Speaking of helplessness, brokenness, and all that we can't do apart from Christ, and yet have in Christ. Um, I want to look at this. So I'm just going to read, because I'd like to read this section and then come back to it. I'm going to read a few chunks here, uh, and we'll kind of dive in. Um, I don't know how this is going to look, honestly. Who knows? I've worked real hard, but it could be totally different. I may go totally off book and end up somewhere else. So we'll just see. So it opens up with, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abide in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Crazy, right? Crazy. So this section of scripture, I mean, I think I've, I've wrestled with this uh, throughout my Christian walk, going through this, this section, and I'll tell you, I'll get into that later, but it's been a struggle through, for me to kind of walk through this over the years. But in the past couple months, and even the past year, I've kind of seen some things that have really been encouraging, and so I want to share those with you this morning. Uh, first off, Jesus starts off by saying, I am the true vine. So this is the way this section begins. First off, he's a teacher. I taught Bible at the Christian school, Mason County Christian School, for two years. And I was always amazed at teachers who could take information and make it tangible and, 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 and applicable and, uh, for, for kids to understand. It's one thing to teach adults where you can, adults can kind of fill in the blank, blanks more. Kids don't do that. You really have to simplify things um, into their most basic form. So that's what he does. He simplifies it down. He, he's, he's painting a picture for us to see. He says, I am the true vine. So first off, I mean, my mind, I don't know about your mind, but in my mind, I'm like instantly transported to like a vineyard. You guys ever been to a vineyard? We like to go. I don't know if that makes me unchristian, but yeah, we like to go to vineyards. They're awesome. I mean, it's just cool to see, and I love the whole concept of a vineyard. I even love the whole concept of grapes. You know that little, that white powder that's on the outside of grapes? Did you guys know that that's yeast? It's natural yeasts that are in the air. And if you were to mash those grapes, put them in a barrel, they would automatically ferment because of the yeast that's on them. It would be a slower process, but they would do it. And then, but vineyards help that along, and so they have all these cool processes. And I just, I'm fascinated by the science of that. It's way cool. But I just, it's also beautiful. I mean, they're gorgeous. I, I, I love eastern Washington uh, because that's like my favorite drive in this state is to just drive across eastern Washington. And then up on the hillside, you'll see all these you know, vineyards in the distance and apple orchards and all kinds of plants that bear fruit and bear these amazing fruits. And so I, instantly, in my mind, I'm like transported there. That's what, I'm, that's what I'm seeing when he says, I am the true vine. I'm, I'm standing in that row right there, looking at those grapes. So he does that. He does it in a way, and in such a simple way that it's, even a child could understand. We grow a lot of apples in Washington. Um, anybody like to go to the Latin cider mill? The place is awesome. Yeah. But the fresh cider, you know when they just squeeze it and then you get that fresh cider? Man, that's amazing. I love it. And then those, uh, add the apple fritters that they do, too. Oh, man, right? I could eat 200 of those. I'd probably die instantly after, but man, they're good. That'd be a way to go, right? I would happily go out after 200 apple fritters. So we grow a lot of apples here in Washington. In fact, it's our, it's our state fruit. Don't know if you knew that or not, but it's our state fruit. But whether it's a grapevine or an apple tree, the concept is the same, right? Apart from that trunk, apart from the vine, apart from that tree, can the branches do anything? No. Nothing. Zero. 
all of their nutrients, everything that a branch needs to bear fruit comes from the vine it's attached to or the trunk it's attached to. Without that, it's nothing. It's useless. It can't do anything. It can't bear fruit. It can't do anything. So Jesus is wanting to draw our attention to the fact that he is the true source of sustenance. He's where all the nutrients come from that feed the rest of the plant. Does that make sense? That's where we get our enrichment from. He's where we get our life from. Everything comes from the vine or the trunk to the rest of the plant. So a couple quick observations. If I cut that branch, again, if I cut this branch off and I throw it away, is it going to bring some, make some grapes? No, nothing. Nada. So he's wanting us to get a handle on that. And that's, that concept is repeated throughout Scripture all over the place all over the place. The next line in this, in verse 1 alone, just verse 1 in itself, next line is, and my father is the vine dresser. So a vine dresser's job is to go through the vineyard and look for bad branches. Okay? And he goes, he basically goes through and he just, he prunes. He prunes. He's pruning those bushes or trees or whatever for the health of that plant. He looks for unhealthy limbs, unfruitful branches, and when he finds them, he takes them away so that the whole plant will bear more fruit. Have you guys been to an apple orchard during pruning season? It's a bloodbath. I mean, these plants are like trashed. Like you look at these, you look at these apple trees and you're just like, Oh my gosh, that is never going to produce apples ever again. There's no way any fruit is going to come from that tree. And you know what? You'd be totally wrong. You'd be totally wrong because what happens is when you take away the branches, the tree pours its energy then into the fruit. It pours its energy into more fruit so your fruit is richer. It's tastier. It's the same with grapes. It's the same with any fruit-bearing plant. Those, some vines and some limbs can suck the life out of a, out of a plant, and so the vine dresser needs to take them away. Yeah, I remember looking at one, and I just saw that we actually we have these trees. This is great, because we have these trees, these two apple trees that are in these vacant fields by our house. There's, we, we walk by them when we go on walks, and every time we look at these trees, we're like, man, that's so sad, because they do produce apples, but they're terrible. They're terrible apples because these trees have not been maintained. So like none of the limbs have been pruned. Like they're these big, I mean, if, if, you, were, if you didn't know anything about trees and you're looking at these, if you didn't know anything about apple trees, you'd think, that's ah, a really healthy looking tree. It's not at all. The apples that come off this tree are basically inedible on both of, well, there's two of them in particular, but they're basically inedible. You can't do anything with them. Nothing. Because the tree was not cared for. We've even thought, let's just go prune the thing and then we'll just harvest the apples since no one else seems to care. You know, nobody's eating the apples anyways. But yeah, but it's amazing. If you just let them go, the tree's fruit will be awful. It'll be awful. It'll pour its energy into the leaves and branches. You may even see healthy shoots going up. But the first thing a vine dresser or uh, somebody that knows about pruning, the first thing they're going to do is those, those, one, those branches that shoot straight up, they're going to lop those off. They're going to lop those straight off. There's going to, they're not going to be any remnant left. They're going to take it all off, and they're going to make sure that the tree is carved down to nothing so that all the fruit hangs low, and it's good. So these poor trees have no one to care for them. They have no one to care for them. Thankfully, what Jesus is describing here is a vine dresser who cares about the vines, who cares about the branches, who cares about the plant. It's his job to ensure that the fruit is healthy, tasty, and nourishing. It's been kind of my natural tendency in studying this section just in terms of bearing fruit. Because, I mean, I look at my life and I'm like, I'm a dirtbag. I'm the worst. Not a good dad. Not a good husband. Not a good friend. Not a good pastor. Not a good worker. I'm a whiner. I'm a complainer. A belly acre. 
Paint any situation as good as you can, and I will find something to whine about in that. That's just who I am. That's how terrible I am. And so I get into this, and I'm like, I'm never bearing fruit, man. It's over. I don't know what you're going to do with this, but it's over. That's not going to happen. I'm the rotten branch. Cut me off. I'm going to get burned. I'm toast. I'm out. Not fruitful. This premise of mine would be a logical premise were it not for the fact that God's not like me or you, right? Are you thankful for that? So thankful for that. Because I, I would cut me off. But God's not like me. Not like us at all. He's not like that. You know when you were a kid and you used to sit over an ant hole or something, you have like your magnifying glass and you're like, you're trying to burn those things and you get the sun just right and then you can melt the ants. No one did that? No? That's all just me? Not psychos like me? Yeah. You're way better than me. Way better. Yeah. Thankfully, God is not like us. He's not sitting up there with a magnifying glass waiting to burn you. Not setting you up for failure. And verse 8, and we'll, we'll keep reading, but verse 8 says, My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit. That you bear much fruit. That's what God is glorified by, that you bear much fruit. And so, I don't know why they added this word in there. This translation says, and so prove to be my disciples. But that word prove is not in there in the Greek. It just says, and so, and become my disciples is what it says. The Father is glorified that you become Jesus' disciples and that you bear fruit. And that you bear fruit. Okay, so God is glorified in that. I want to back up and read uh, the rest of this section through verse 11. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown out. Uh, he's thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. I want to stop there. Think about that statement. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. I want to ask a question. Did the Father ever say Jesus' toast? No, he poured the wrath of God on him. He poured all his wrath on him. Then he raised him up. He never abandoned him. That's what he's saying. That's the love. The Father, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. In that same way, that same type of love. And he says, abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. Your joy may be made full. So this whole concept of fruit bearing, um, I think in some ways it's kind of been confusing for me because um, I just, I don't, I haven't under, I, it's been hard to wrestle through like what is that, what does that look like? Do you, guys, do you guys have kind of an, and you could just nod, but do you have an idea? Like, is there an idea in your mind as to what you think that looks like, maybe? I feel like everybody's got sort of a, this is, and, and this is what that is. Right? Most of the time, for me, it's, that becomes like a crushing weight. Like, this is what that is, and I'm not that. And I don't have that, and I'm never going to have that. I'm hopeless. I'm going to be cast out. God's going to get rid of me. And that's where my mind goes. That's where my mind goes. And this section would seem to agree. It would almost seem to agree. Apart from him, we can do nothing. We cannot bear fruit apart from Jesus, the vine, because the fruit comes from him ultimately and not from us. That's kind of encouraging and discouraging. It doesn't come from me. It doesn't come from David Carnan. It comes from the source, from Jesus. We're just the vessel that for some reason God has elected to bear fruit through. So I've got some observations. I just kind of want to talk about fruit a little bit more and then I'll uh, kind of tie this together, hopefully tie this together for, for us. But So first, number one, fruit is not for the tree. 
Seems like a simple statement, but it's not for the, the plant. Like the grapes aren't for the vine. The vine's not sitting there going, yep, I'm going to eat these things up. It's some good grapes. Who are they for? What's it for? Who's the fruit for? Everybody else. It's not for us. It's for everybody else. I think the part where we kind of go haywire with this and get in some crazy tangents in our heads is that it's, our, it's in our fallen nature to sort of crave something that we can attach value to, right? For some of us, that may be productivity. I want to attach value to productivity. Maybe it's relationships. I want to attach value to relationships. But at some level, I think there's this sort of confusion in our heads that somehow this fruit that God is producing in, in us is for us. It's not. It's for everybody else. Which in, its, in, its, in that statement is kind of a, it's, it's sort of a soul identity killing statement, isn't it? Because then it's like, I don't get to, but you mean I don't get to take the credit? What? But surely, like, if I'm doing this, this, and that, and all this fruit's coming out, then I can look at that and go, yes, finally, I'm making it. I'm doing it. It's not there for you. It's for everybody else. Secondly, fruit highlights the type of tree or vine that, it's, that it comes from. If you're eating a grape, you know the grape came from a grape vine. If you're eating an apple, you know the apple came from an apple tree. It highlights the tree. No one looks at the branch and is like, man, those branches, they're awesome. Those are really cool. You're a really good branch. Right? It just seems silly when you think about it like that, but that's what we do in our heads all the time. Right? I'm going to at a point to my greatness that I bore this fruit for you. Behold! So I want to be treated when I walk in the door after I get off work. Behold, he has arrived. How great thou art. <laughs> it's not for us. The branches point to the one the fruit comes from. Do you see? So the attachment is Jesus is the vine where all the nutrients, all the life comes from. The Father is the loving vine dresser who goes through the vineyard ensuring the life of the plant so that all those eating the fruit will be sustained. So where does that leave us in the mix? What's left for us then? I mean, all we have is Christ. Can he really be enough for me? Can he really be sufficient for me? Surely I need more. Can't be enough. This was just an interesting observation. And um, I, I just thought this was... It's kind of a cool wordplay that Paul uses in, in Galatians. But he's, he, uh, when he's talking about the work, the, he's talking about fleshly actions. He says the works of the flesh, and then he defines all the garbage that comes out of us. On the other side, though, when he's in, uh, in Galatians 5, he says, and the fruit of the Spirit is. Isn't that interesting? The fruit of the Spirit is but the work of the flesh. He doesn't use fruit of the flesh. He says work of the flesh. He doesn't say work of the Spirit. He says fruit of the Spirit. I just find that intriguing. Especially because Jesus in this section is highlighting the very same concept that Paul is highlighting later. And I think what happens with us is, and this is, I'll just use me, when I am working to try to produce what I think God wants from me, 100% of the time, usually the end result is not good. Usually I only end up hurting those around me. Hurting my spouse. Because guess what? I, 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 the minute I start thinking that, I think, I'm doing it, I'm doing it, things are going well. Th and you should do it too. You should be where I'm at. Because look how awesome I am and all the things I'm doing. And I just bludgeon and bludgeon and attack and hurt all those around me. Why? Because apart from Jesus, I can do nothing. Death is the only result of anything other than abiding in the vine. 
death because that's all I'm capable of producing. When I look at it like that, I'm like, this seems so logical. Like, it's like, how could I miss it? I can't do anything apart from you. Can't do anything apart from you. Ultimately, if our desire is to produce fruit, our desire, if our desire is to be of real benefit to others in any capacity whatsoever, to love as we've been loved, to serve as we've been served, to give as we've been given to, then the answer is always the same. And it simplifies our pursuit because the answer is abide in Jesus. The word is meno in the Greek. It means stay, remain, you could even use the word depend. It just has to do with literally binding your identity, your person, your worth, value, everything to this person of Jesus. If he succeeds, you succeed. If he fails, you fail. But he's never going to fail, which is the hope there for me. Abiding means to lean into dependence and weakness. Recognizing that this is the only safe place for us. There is no safety outside of that for us because the inevitable result of all of our work and effort to prove how fantastic and amazing we are is death. And ultimately, guess who suffers the most as a result of that? Well, we do first, but then everybody else around us does. In my pursuit to live apart from Christ, the irony is I produce death. And the other side of that is me saying, I got nothing. Allowing my identity to die, God produces life. Fruit yields fruit through you, through your death, through your dying to you. This, is, this section is kind of a, double-edged sword. So, and this is kind of a confusing, I just want to share this because my mind kind of does this and I don't know if yours does too. But he says on the one hand, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So if you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abided in his love. First off, what did he just say a few verses earlier? Apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. And yet, if it takes, does it take me keeping his commandments then to abide in his love? So in order to abide, I've got to keep, but in order to keep, I've got to abide. Does anybody else's brain, like, does that turn anyone else's brain in knots a little bit? It does. What he's doing here is he's forcing, he's forcing you and I to come to terms with the fact that we have nothing. It forces you to go, then who then can be saved? And then what's the answer to that question? With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. He's forcing you into a Red Sea situation with what he's saying. You see that? So you got the, the you got a wall to your right, wall to your left. I can't keep the commandments. So how can I abide in your love? But you're saying I have to, if I want to abide in your love, I've got to keep the commandments? I can't. This is impossible. This is impossible. It is impossible. It's crazy. And yet God does the impossible, right? Is he or is he not the God of the impossible? The God of impossible commands. He spoke the universe into existence. I mean, explain that one. Can you? Every snowflake, did you know it's uniquely, no snowflake is identical to one another? That every mole, even the molecules of the snowflake, the way that they're each individually structured, will be will are literally designed to sh be shaped into these amazing geometric shapes. Every snowflake. It's crazy. I mean, this God is doing does impossible things all the time. Our planet impossible. Impossible. The odds of of Earth existing 
as it is right now, if you look at just the, the numeric odds, it's like one in a trillion, 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 trillion. In other words, mathematically impossible. Lazarus being raised from the dead. Possible or impossible? Impossible. So when I look at me and I go, there's no way. There's no way you could do that. It's impossible. Yeah, but I know a guy who can do the impossible. That's the situation we're in. That is the level of helplessness we're in. It's impossible. And the most beautiful thing is you have this loving, tender father who roots us in the vine, Christ, and does this in us. It's nuts. It blows my mind. Blows my mind. So continuing on through the rest of this section, this is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves for a slave does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me. This is a key verse. You did not choose me but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. This is my command that you love one another. This would be really discouraging if it was like up to me. You feel that? Be really discouraging if God's like, you got to do it, man. You could do it. Make it happen. How discouraged? I mean, maybe that's just me. Is my the only one that gets discouraged by that? What, like, it stresses me out. If it's that situation, we're toast. I'm just going to say it right now because we're not doing it. There's no way. In fact, it would seem that everything in us wants to do the opposite of that. Go the other way. So it's so comforting to me when Jesus comes back and he says, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain. You have a promise from the one who's not only capable of sustaining you, but also the one who's capable of shaping and pruning and taking away what needs to be taken away, putting in what needs to be put in, and then also the one who's capable of bearing fruit at every level. You have Christ, the vine, Father, the vine dresser, the spirit, the fruit bearer. In other words, it's not on you. It's not on you. It's not on me. It's on him. The full weight of everything he demands from us is not on us, but him. It's him. The craziest part is, and all this for me as I've wrestled through this, is that God then rewards us. And that blows my mind. Like, really? Like, you do it all. From step A to step Z, you do everything, and yet you put a crown on our heads. Does that make any sense? No. I said it a couple weeks ago, but who is this person? Who does that? No human. No human, but God is that person. There's none like him. There's none that would take dirt. Make that dirt into a man. Be rejected by that man. Then send his son to redeem that man. Not only just take away his sins, but then clothe him in righteousness. Sustain him through his whole life. Bring that, bring that person into his kingdom. Bless them with all the riches that he has. Put a crown on their head as if they did anything at all. And I think it didn't make sense to the 24 elders that you see in Revelation because what do they do? They're like, nope, that's yours. And that's the relationship that we've been invited into with God. 
This is where fruit bearing takes place. It is in this relationship of God just pouring out, pouring out, pouring out, pouring out. Us just enjoying that. And as a result of that enjoyment, pouring out. It's as simple as that. It's the overflow of the overflow. And that relationship of giving, love, tenderness, compassion, kindness, that God just infinitely, generously pours out for us, we're meant to be basking in that and enjoying that. And instead, my mind's like, I gotta, I gotta do something. I gotta make something. I gotta, I wanna bear fruit for God. I'm gonna do amazing things for God. I can't. You can't. I can't, I can't love you. You can't love me. It's not in you. And it's not in me. Because it doesn't come from us. And it's not supposed to. And God is not going to burn you with a magnifying glass because he, he knows what you're capable of, which is nothing. He's not a vindictive tyrant waiting for you to fail. It's just not him. That's us, but not him. Not him. God invites us into a relationship of rest. <sighs> invites us into a relationship where we're rooted in the vine, nurtured by the Father, cultivated by his spirit who ultimately brings about the fruit that he's going to bring about in us and do what he's going to do. But it means death to you in one sense. It means death to our identity. It means that David Carnahan doesn't get to take credit. And yes, yeah, sometimes that ticks me off. I'm like, I just want like a little bit of credit, man. And that's my fall on thinking. It's silly. It's silly. It's childish but we want it, so we fight, and we fight, and we fight. And for what reason? Why do we keep fighting? It's nonsensical. He's saying, I'm going to give you rest, and we're just like, no, I'm going to work. Which you, but like, there's a whole feast and banquet over here. You're free to just come enjoy. No, I'm going to work myself, like my kids. I'm going to do it myself, Daddy. I can do it. No, you can't. You can't do it. I can't do it. You can't do it. And fortunately for us, we have a God who can and did and is doing and will do. That is the relationship we've been invited into, one where we can rest. God's saying, enjoy it. Enjoy. Rest. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, for I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I'm meek and lowly at heart, he says. You will find rest for your souls. Rest for your souls in his sufficiency, his supply, his kindness, his goodness, his love, his grace, his compassion. On and on and on we could go. That is the relationship we've been invited into. And from that, look, God will do what he's going to do and he's going to bear fruit in, in the way that only he can because he's the only one that has any supply to begin with. He's invited you into that and me into that. So praying for us as we go through the rest of today that God would help us to rest. Help us to know that our, we are secure in the vine and the, in the loving hands of the Father and that the Spirit is with us doing what he could, He's planned and promised to accomplish in us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this, uh, the gift of your word. Thank you for the gift of your grace and your mercy towards us. I pray that as we reflect on these concepts this morning, that you would help us to, to rest in our hearts. Help us to know that you've done it all. Help us to realize that you've invited us to enjoy you. And that from that, from that enjoyment, you produce the fruit you intend for us to produce. So we yield this morning. We just... Thank you again for you, who you are, and pray that you would bless the rest of this day. In Jesus' name, amen.